Today, we start an epic deep dive into the history of Mazda with Mazda Part 1. That's right, Part 1. We got to name the parts because there's four of them. <laughs> uh, this is the birth of one of the coolest, most independent car brands on the planet. Talking Miatas, talking RX-7s, talking tons of stuff that you guys like. Where did it come from? The origins might shock you. Very, very cool story. Diving in. Part one of a four-part series on Mazda. It's the morning of August 6th, 1945. Toyo Kuchiya president Jujiro Matsuda is heading back home after visiting company headquarters in nearby Hiroshima. Jujira is a self-made icon, and his small trucks, called Mazdas, have become fixtures of the city. The bustling urban center in his rearview mirror has mostly been spared from the bombing that has devastated other Japanese cities in the past few years, and it seems as if the war may finally draw to a close soon. But on the sunny August morning, days before his birthday, Jujira and his driver make their way behind the large hill separating the city from the suburban factory, and suddenly, there's a bright flash. A shockwave follows almost instantly, and the vehicle is thrown from the road. Injured, he and his driver climb from the wrecked car, horrified to see a growing, mushroom-shaped cloud rising from behind the hill. The city that had grown on the backs of Mazda trucks for more than a decade had vanished in an instant, and it would be Jujiro and the Mazdas that would lead its rebuilding. But how did the son of a poor fisherman become a Hiroshima success story? How did he set a cork manufacturing company on the path to the Mazda we know today? And how did he and this young company rise to reunite and rebuild a city destroyed by an atomic bomb? Today on Pass Gas, it's part one of our four-part series on the history of Mazda. Pass Gas! It's about cars, it's not about ports! Big thanks to Freeze Pipe for sponsoring this episode of Pass Gas. Shop now at thefreezepipe.com and use code GAS for 10% off your entire order. That's freezepipe.com and code GAS for 10% off. Order today and get free shipping and say goodbye to harsh smoke forever. Jim buy a tie. That means driver and car become one as an archer became one with his horse. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's the thought behind Mazda's cars. How do you say it again? Jim by a tie. Just think if Jim from the office <laughs> yeah. showed up oh, he buy a without tie. a tie, Dwight would say, Jim by a tie. <laughs> That's how I remember it. That's great. Yeah. Mazda is not the biggest car company in the world, not the biggest car company in Japan, still independent in a world that is where most companies are owned by a bigger company. Or each other. Yeah. Or you know. each other. I mean, really, they are. They all just own each other. Mm -hmm. um, Mazda is like a bastion of independence. Yeah. Uh, and they intend to stay that way. They keep it small. Mm -hmm. They don't scale just to scale. They're so independent that when we did a wheelhouse on who, what car manufacturers own, other car manufacturers, we didn't forgot to put Mazda in. Mm-hmm. They're just a tiny little sliver of that big chart. Yeah. That big old chart. They, they got a lot true of to themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I have a buddy who works at Mazda. I did not meet him through Donut Productions or anything wow. like that. He's a truly okay. a nut, just a friend. You know you're allowed to meet people. And you're I know, but really okay. defensive you gotta, like, about this already. That, you know, like, you do. But he says it is like a small business. Being, mm -hmm. I mean, it's a really big small business, mm -hmm. Mazda, yeah. uh, which is always interesting to hear about the inner workings of that. Fun news. We just made contact with Bob Hall, the designer of the Miata, mm -hmm. and we were talking about maybe getting him in on our new podcast, The Big oh, Three, yeah, big at three. some point. That'd be well, rad. Not one of the big three, but... Yeah. Yeah. But he's supposed to be really fun, and he goes to a bunch of Miata meetups, and he lives in Pasadena. Lives in Pasadena. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. And he owns one of the six color Miatas that are really coveted. They only made six kooky colors, and he owns the teal one. Sweet. Yeah. Let's get him on the show. Absolutely. My name is Nolan Sykes. Speaking of shows, welcome to Past Gas. Uh, I'm joined by my two co-hosts, as always, across from me, James Pumphrey. Jim, buy a tie and give me back my son. 
<laughs> and Joe Weber. Future What's father. What's up, Wink Wink Nation? Well, all, all of us might be future fathers. Might be, but it's like he's got it yeah, on the schedule. On the way, yeah. <laughs> It's on the it's yeah. scheduled in. father. Yes. Yeah, you guys are father. you guys are like the Cadillac Andretti team. Yeah. No, we didn't get denied, sons. <laughs> well, maybe maybe in like twenty twenty eight. Like someone happen. was like, I don't <laughs> think you, I don't think you'd be a competitive father. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just I don't like I just don't think you could make hosses. one son and then turn around and make another son for the regulation changes. Mm-hmm. Oh, a homologation son? Yeah, or that's one of the reasons they didn't. Yeah, that, I mean that should have been like the first reason they gave on yeah. their reason sheet. Instead, it was like the fourth one down. And it's like yeah. that's the most compelling argument. Yeah, yeah when you read that, yeah. you're like, that makes sense. Yeah, not the oh, it, they're not going to be competitive. It's like, bitch, you have like three teams that suck ass. Yeah, yeah. three teams that suck ass, and also ask anyone in the general public to name a racing family. Yeah. Or like just a name from mm-hmm. racing and like nine out of and 10 would be like, I don't know, Andretti. It's mm-hmm. not like they're jumping in cold either. They're like pretty president Lamont. Like super they're, president Lamont. Yeah. Super president in Indy. Super president in WRC. Yeah. Super president. Every, dude, they like race in everything but F1. And F1 is adding another US date you to know what Chicago. I think it is. I think that F1 is becoming too American. I think it's just competition with the other teams. Think, they don't. They don't want another team to compete with. I they think don't they want don't the want prize pool to be team. smaller. I don't, they I don't think. want another American team. I mean, Haas is barely American anyway. They had like the Russian flag all over the cars when yeah, uh, yeah. that dude was driving. Uh, dude, they let Brad Pitt movie be a team, and they mm-hmm. won't let Andretti be a team. Yeah. Anyway, I've seen him in his underpants. Brad Pitt. Mario Andretti. I know. Yeah, I've seen Brad Pitt in his underpants in well, movies. on TV. Yeah. In movies, he's got that V, uh huh, mm-hmm. that drives the wind Cum gutters. crazy. <laughs> <Cum> gutters. <laughs> That's what they're called. That's what the doctors call them. <laughs> you can't take what it do- out, Gavin. You what can't take you it out. To? It's what go- doctors call them. It's like saying tonsils. <laughs> <laughs> tonsils. Yeah, it's what they're called. I went to medical school. <laughs> Jujiro Matsuda. Okay, was, so without further ado, <laughs> yes. let's get into part one of our four-part series it's be a long one. in Mazda. We looked at all of our videos and all these stories. We love telling stories, and there's some that are just so big, yeah. and we want to dig so deep into them that it's going to take multiple episodes to cover everything. So uh, we did it with Mercedes. This is yeah. an even deeper dive into Mazda. It takes longer because we have to get a permit from the city to dig that deep yeah. into <laughs> yeah. these stories. Yeah, we're not we're not that lady on TikTok. I just <laughs> dig that? it under our house. <laughs> I watch her too. She's got shut down. Really? Yeah, rightfully so. By her city, the city? Yeah. <laughs> she's she no, doing it under her house though. Yeah, she was digging or, it under her house, but it was that's like- That's probably why. What? Normally in California, you don't need like a permit to dig in your backyard. You have property rights underground. But you have to California. you have to check to see if there's lines that you. Well, yeah. Might so you check strike. the lines, and there you go. Well, yeah. But she it's was like she was digging a tunnel that was she was mining mm-hmm. essentially, and then she was just dumping the debris back into the water table. Yeah, that's not good. Oh, man. And also good. like her lot was less than like an acre. Mm-hmm. So it was like an immediate danger to her neighbors of like their homes like maybe <laughs> like a sinkhole or something. Yeah, she's a. Idiot. She did pour the concrete uh like wrong and then it yeah. collapsed at some point. Yeah. Remember that guy who stole, stole the tank in San Diego? The killdozer? No, no, the guy who stole the tank in San Diego. No. That this he got like, he got shot. He got shot by a yeah. cop. Um I remember about him digging. This is like well, yeah. That whole thing was because he wanted to get a permit so he could mine for gold in his backyard, but <laughs> San Diego wouldn't let him. You uh-huh. know why? Why? Because they told him he didn't need a permit, but he kept uh, going, give me the permit. Yeah. They're like, you don't need one. Just dude. You're fine. It. Just do your thing. Yeah. Yeah. He also had a meth operation going on in his okay, house. Okay. So, so that probably contributed yeah. to his irrational behavior. Yeah. And what he would do <laughs> is he would hire teenagers in his neighborhood no! to mine, mine the gold. The gold but they discovered, I mean, there was no gold in his backyard. Yeah. What they would do is break into houses. Uh, steal gold jewelry what? and just put it in the mine That's and tell so them funny. tell the guy that they, they found, found it wow. jewelry yeah oh man and he's like great they probably Keep didn't going. think that was gonna lead to him getting shot no in a tank no yeah the meth is bad don't ever do meth yeah so anyway 
Uh, so yeah, that's how deep we're gonna be digging into this <laughs> meth head gold l- mine. lady deep. Yeah, uh, city might shut us down. We we're gonna be dumping facts back into the water table. We're in immediate danger to the citizens of Inglewood because Uh-oh. we are digging. So deep. So the apartment deep. building next to our office might cave in, yeah. but guys, we're willing to take that risk because we need you to know <laughs> everything about Mazda. This is everything you need to know to get up to speed on Mazda. Jujiro Matsuda was born the youngest of 12 in Mukanada, a suburb of Hiroshima, in August of 1875. His father was a fisherman and died when he was only three years old. The poor financial circumstances of the Matsuda family meant Jujiro was unable to attend school. Instead, he accompanied his older siblings out on a boat at a very young age to learn the fisherman trade. It reminds Ooh. me of Godzilla minus one when I he goes out on the just boat. Because that's, a <laughs> that is true. There are boats in that movie. Jujiro was forced to grow up quickly. It's a at, very romantic time in Japan. At age 13, he moved by himself to Osaka to become a blacksmith's apprentice. Whoa. During this time, he developed a passion for machines and decided to dedicate his life to engineering in the machine industry. Nice. For nearly two decades, Jujira's desire to learn more engineering skills led to work in a variety of factories, such as shipyards and arsenals. This was, this was back when Nintendo was a playing card company. That's true. You know your stuff, Joe. Dude, that is so <laughs> sick. You're going to kill this app. I told them. I warned them we were going deep. Jujira's enthusiasm for machines and manufacturing was boundless, and he would often use his lunch breaks to visit nearby factories and pick the brains <laughs> wow. of the engineers, foundry men, and factory managers. So he's like, I'm off work. I'm going to go visit another work. Yeah. Maybe I'll make this work better yeah. by talking about work at that other work. <laughs> <laughs> He also took any opportunity to break down a machine to its component parts and reassemble it to get a better understanding of how it worked. And that's what meth heads do. <laughs> yeah. It's all a cir- go it goes around a circle. This well, dude decided what he wanted to do when he was 13 and then mm-hmm. like kept with it. And I can relate, except his was like, learning how stuff worked and making things better. And mine was goofing off with my friends. At 13, I was like, I just want to goof off with my pals all my whole life. And, you know, we both made it happen. We made it happen. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Joe, to your point about meth heads taking things apart, they usually do take it apart. They never put, it, they back put, together. It, they put it back together. They don't put it back together. Growing yeah. up across from my parents' house, mm-hmm. there was a house where they were doing meth. Flop and house? They, flop house, yeah. Definitely flop house situation. But the, one of the guys, he loved his cars. Yeah. Had a few projects and yep. quotes of his own one of them was like a, a nissan mini truck that he just cut the roof off mm-hmm. it's a project. That, was, that was it yeah that's so a perfect I had project heads yeah. living down the street from me at one of my houses in cal in la and uh there's a misconception that like meth heads might be like ocd and clean they're not they do they no. undo a lot mm-hmm. yeah and they hoard a lot Really, a lot of vacuuming going yeah, on. They're not very productive. They're just real overthinkers. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they had tons of bikes taken apart, and I don't think they bought them. <laughs> they also, they also, it was like, I think, I assume, like, someone's grandma died and like left them this house. That's what happened like, in our situation. Yeah. Because uh-huh. it was like, oh, that house is probably like $3 million mm-hmm. or something. And they would just hang out in the garage mm-hmm. and they like put up like a blanket on the garage door so you like couldn't see in the thing. It's like, you know it's your house. Yeah. Hang out in the house. <laughs> like, we used to hang out in garages when we were kids because mm-hmm. our parents had the house. And it's just like the meth head, like, thought process was like, oh, I got this sweet garage. Yeah. It's like, yeah, but you have the house, too. <laughs> <laughs> By the early 1900s, Jujiro was married and had started a family and was determined to build a good life for them. By 31, he had 18 years of experience in the manufacturing sector. That's like what modern companies require. (laughs) (laughs) Must have 18 years experience and be 31 years old. Mm -hmm. Uh, And he decided it was time to go into business for himself. In 1906, he founded Matsuda Seisakusho out of a 355 square foot cow shed. That's a little cow shed. (laughs) Barely big enough for one cow. That's pretty small. 10 by 30-ish. Yeah, small. Yeah, it's unclear what the business originally manufactured, but it struggled early on because the product was something that was already well established on the market. So Jujiro refocused. Rather than creating something new, though, 
he would do what he had done for years, study machines. He turned his attention to products where he saw room for improvement, broke them down just as he had did for the last 18 years, and remanufactured higher quality versions of them. This process led directly to his first successful product, the exclusive patented Matsuda pump, a large centrifugal pump used for draining water. Nice. Business began to take off, and Jujiro was determined to make his company known for being on the leading edge of pump technology. <laughs> he began importing the most advanced versions of the machines he needed, a highly unconventional approach for the time, which introduced several new manufacturing technologies to Japan. Yeah, wow. at that time, Japan was extremely isolated, so importing anything was out of the ordinary. Legend has it that after Matsuda Seisakusho became successful, a sentimental Jujiro chose to expand the business by taking over management at the foundry in Osaka, where he had been a blacksmith apprentice in his teens. Wow. Then, in the early 1910s, he used the knowledge he gained from his prior work in arsenals to found his second company, an armament manufacturer called Matsuda Works. That's a cool name. Yeah, Matsuda Works is like a sick like yeah. racing fabrication. I love that. The company grew rapidly after it was commissioned as a supplier for the Tsar of Russia and by the Japanese military and grew over to 4,000 employees at its peak. Matsuda that's Works so would be a sick name for a Mazda tuner. Mm -hmm. Matsuda Works. Yeah. Oh, that's a deep cut. You get so yeah. many daps at... MWR, Matsuda yeah. Works Racing. <laughs> yeah. MWF, Matsuda Works Fabrication. And you call yourself MILF. So that's pretty interesting. He's getting work from <laughs> Russia and Japan, which had previously, like just a few years before that, had their own conflict. Mm. That's weird. Oh, that was when the, Russia got that island above Japan, I right? I believe so. By the mid-1910s, Jujiro was eager to return home to Hiroshima. He first tried to expand the Matsuda Works manufacturing operations back to his hometown, but was eventually forced out of the company over disagreements over said expansion. In 1918, now 43 years old, he sold off his remaining business ventures and made his return to his hometown as a wealthy and widely respected businessman. Poor guy. Two years later, <laughs> he and a group of investors would invest in a cork manufacturing company called Toyo Cork Cochio Corporation a company that would later become known as Mazda. Noise. To understand corks, we got to go back <laughs> to ancient Rome. Yeah. Toyo Cork was founded on January 30th, 1920, and struggled from the beginning. Demand for cork had fallen dramatically after the end of World War I, and the company's problems were compounded when the president became ill and was forced to retire barely a year after founding. Toyo Cork was desperate to stay afloat, and the company turned to Jujiro to right the ship. Speaking of afloat, uh, I just watched a video of like all the ships that sank in Lake Superior, mm. well, and sick. it's so cold and so deep that the bodies don't decompose. Ugh. So there's a shipwreck from 1927, yeah. and there's a guy <laughs> that is just floating around down there that is called Old Whitey that has a big white beard, and it's like... He's wearing a cork vest, and so he's still he's like in the ship's hold, and it's like a rite of passage for divers to shake his hand. Ugh. Yeah. Oh, uh, that's <laughs> sick. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's so sick, dude. Yeah. I, uh, <laughs> I mean, like, not gross. I'm not grossed out by it. I'm just very crude. I know. Yeah. I would Give me never. The jeebs. You couldn't torture me into like diving. I would 100% like do that. Yeah. You would do it? Yeah. Oh, God. I'm that kind of guy. <laughs> <laughs> but you wouldn't shake his hand. I would shake his hand. It just, <laughs> it's just very haunting. It's yeah. It's like one of the most haunting things I've ever heard in my like life. Like literally a hundred year old dead guy. A hundred year old dead guy with a white beard. Preserved. And, yeah. a, and a creepy nickname and yeah. a vest like floating around like this. And then you go down there and he's just been there. Yeah. I bet his eyeballs are gone. For eat fish eating them, yeah, yeah. Oh, you think you fish? think there's fish down there? Probably not. When I said that, I was like, no, it's that's really wrong. devoid of oxygen, which is why they don't decompose. Oh, yeah, mm. probably no fish. Yeah, that's so deep then, almost like how deep we're going with this. <laughs> yeah, almost as <laughs> deep as we're gonna episode. go in this four part series about Mazda. <laughs> 
For weekend warriors to everyday adventurers, discover the 2024 Subaru Crosstrek. It comes standard with symmetrical all-wheel drive, designed to help optimize traction in rain, snow, on bad roads, or even when there's no road at all. A choice between two Subaru Boxer engines, a standard 2.0-liter or an available 2.5-liter, which is retuned for 2024 to deliver 182 horsepower and even more torque for responsive, confident acceleration. With 8.7 inches of ground clearance and X mode with hill descent control, which electronically optimizes the engine, transmission, and other systems for increased traction in slippery conditions, Crosstrek helps provide peace of mind on almost any road. These cars are super dependable, very capable, they've got a very durable exterior, and new for 2024, an improved interior. This thing's awesome. Love is out there. Find it in a Crosstrek. Learn more at Subaru.com. Big thanks to Shopify for sponsoring this episode of Pass Gas. Selling a little... or a lot... Shopify helps you do your thing, however your cha-ching. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. From the launch your little online shop stage to the first real life store stage, all the way up to did we just hit half a million orders stage? Shopify is there to help you grow. Whether you're selling scented soap or offering outdoor outfits, Shopify helps you sell everywhere. From their all-in-one e-commerce platform to their in-person POS system, wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. What I love about Shopify is that it gives you control over how you grow your business. This is the kind of tool that I'm looking for if I'm going to start a business. Plus, Shopify's award-winning help is there to support your success every step of the way. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash gas, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash gas now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash gas. Thanks, Shopify. Despite the company being outside of his realm of expertise, Chijiro accepted the challenge and became the second company president in 1921 and is viewed as its effective founder by Mazda. Chijiro's early leadership helped stabilize the company, but he quickly realized the cork business would never be very profitable. And after a fire destroyed the factory in 1925, began efforts to refocus the business. Over the next two years, the company was transformed into what Jujira knew best, a machine works operation. And the company was renamed the Toyo Kogio Corp in 1927. They originally specialized in air compressors and tooling machines, but Jujira was as determined as ever to keep his company on the cutting edge and saw opportunity in the rapidly growing automotive sector. Hmm? Hmm, guys? Hmm. Hmm, hmm guys? <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. Pay attention. Because, you know? Because <laughs> maybe that has something to do with the Miata. Hmm? <laughs> hmm? Maybe this is when he starts thinking, hmm, maybe, maybe these cars aren't so dumb after all. You ever think about that? <laughs> That's what he said. Just think about it, guys. Pay attention. There's going to be a quiz. Rather than focus on expensive four-wheeled cars that could only be used for personal transit, Jajiro wanted his company product to fit the needs of society at large. At the time, Japan was modernizing at an unprecedented pace, and Jujiro decided that a simple three-wheeled truck design would, quote, improve the quality of people's lives and the development of the country. But the company had very little in the way of automotive expertise or manufacturing capabilities. Rather than outsource technology or production, it was important to Jujiro that the company be able to complete as much of the process and build as many components as possible in-house to ensure a high level of quality control. Uh, guys, seem familiar? <laughs> Pretty similar to them today. This is why you go deep, guys, <laughs> so you can see stuff like this, the primordial beginnings of a company, okay? <laughs> 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 
Once the infrastructure was in place in 1929, the company decided to test their design principles and manufacturing capabilities by developing a motorcycle prototype. Now, a motorcycle was the ideal starting point for the needs-minded Jajiro, as the technology was relatively affordable and the design process would be much shorter than designing a larger vehicle. The Toyo Kogio had the perfect place to showcase their new product, too. Motorcycle racing had become increasingly popular in Japan throughout the 1920s and was a regular attraction for the residents of Hiroshima. One of the most popular races of the year, the Chinkan no Matsuri, or Shokonsai, was a memorial race honoring those who died in the line of duty in the service of Japan. Jajiro's team decided to enter to compete against the long-dominated British-made bikes. By October 1930, the 250cc two-stroke motorcycle prototype was finished. That's a big old honker, dude. 250 in 1930? Pretty good. Yeah. yeah. And the team was ready to go racing. At that year's memorial race, the Toyo Kogio team pulled off an upset, defeating the highly favored Ariel. Oh. Yeah, guys. Ariel was mm. a big company. Ariel, not just a mermaid. <laughs> Mazda had just won <laughs> its first race. The company built and sold a total of 30 motorcycles through the end of the year. The automotive team had proven their capabilities, and Toyo Kogio was confident enough to launch their three-wheeled truck. Three-wheeled truck. Scary. <laughs> I can't even, like, conceptualize what... Like, it's a like a tuk-tuk. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. It might have had bars. Like, rhymes? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, like... Uh, yeah, like I, I little, guarantee you it had a bars. A little cabin. Yeah, yeah. Like and then the a, little, a little bed on the back. Yeah, Reliant Robin has a wheel. I know, but they're Reliant. The first one they made was like that. Mm. Like what wow. you described. That's Lame. deep. Told you, dude. See, you guys, we're going deep. We're digging under our house for this beach. <laughs> we're going to see some freaking lava. <laughs> <laughs> but Jujira wasn't entirely satisfied with the simplistic two-stroke and wanted this piece of the company to have the same cutting-edge reputation as the rest. The company began work on a four-stroke engine almost immediately. Using the knowledge they gained from building motorcycles, the team managed to finish designing the truck and its new engine in only 10 months. And before the end of 1931, this three-wheel truck hit the streets. The truck known as the Mazda Go, great name, especially for back then. What do you think about Nolan? Very current name. Even though I was listening to everything, yeah, uh, I was not prepared for how not a truck this thing is. Oh, it's a motorcycle. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a tricycle. Yeah. And yeah. it's got was, the Mitsubishi logo on it, It does. Too. It has the TriStar on there. Uh -huh. That's pretty interesting. Um, oh, interesting. But yeah, it's basically motorcycle in the front. Uh, party in the back. Party in the back. It's got two wheels in the back and a little bed, but it's it's a motorcycle. Yeah, it's a motorcycle with like a dump truck on it. Yeah. I yeah. would say it's business sick, in though. the back, party in the front. Yeah, business in the back, mm, party in the like front. Which is like a reverse mullet? It is very much so a motorcycle. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> cool seat, though. Very, very good looking. <laughs> yeah. Very nice. I like the colorway. Colorway is sick. Green and gold, like my Packers. Yeah. Like my Packers. You my actually Packers. do own part of the Packers. <laughs> well, the Mazda Go quickly became known as the pride of Hiroshima for its build quality, and for fitting the needs of people and business across the city. Its four-stroke engine was considered luxurious by the standards of the day and was a rarity at its price point. Yeah, I would imagine most motorcycles are two-stroke at this mm -hmm. point. <laughs> the truck was also perfect for the narrow streets of Japan and was used for all sorts of business needs, from construction to hauling produce. Just those two. All sorts, I said. Imagine putting like a big old freaking sheet of plywood on the back of that thing. Yeah, dude. Can you imagine having a bunch of cute dogs back there? Dude. Sure can. They're all wearing little goggles. All wearing little goggles. They're like uh, Shibu Inus. Huh? Oh. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> nice, yeah, nice, nice pole. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. It's a Japanese dog. <laughs> <laughs> In January 1934, an updated version of the Mazda Go known as the Type DC. 
<laughs> Still very much a motorcycle <laughs> with a dump truck on the back was launched. It was also the first product to carry a Mazda logo. From that point forward, all of the company's vehicles would bear the Mazda name, a name that held a dual purpose. Mazda stems from Ahura Mazda, the god of harmony, intelligence, and wisdom from early Western Asian civilizations. Mm. According to the company today, quote, key members of Toyo Kogio interpreted Mazda as a symbol of the beginning of the East and West civilization, but also a symbol of automotive civilization and culture. Whoa. In addition to this grandiose ideal, the name is also similar to the pronunciation of Matsuda, especially in Japanese. And it served to honor Jujira, who had saved and transformed the company. That's sick. Great name, Mazda. Mazda. Yeah, I didn't know the origins of that. In April 1936, Mazda kicked off its first publicity campaign by organizing a caravan of three-wheeled trucks to drive 1,677 miles from Kagoshima, one of the southernmost cities on the main Japanese islands, to Tokyo. In August, they ended a sales partnership with Mitsubishi. That would explain the diamonds. No who was the exclusive vendor of the Mazda Go and established their own Mazda brand dealerships. So that that was their first collab. Mm -hmm. Mazda has been known to collab with uh, Ford. Mm -hmm. The B2000 truck was actually the Ranger. Mm -hmm. Uh, They also collaborated with some other of the big three. The the Ford Escape was also a Mazda-derived model as well. I think it was not the Protégé, but... um some other SUV thing. I forgot about the protege. My old roommate Pro- has to protege wagon. One. Pretty fun. Yeah. Mazda five. That was a protege. Yeah. Nolan used to be my protege. Mm-hmm. Nice. Now uh, the, the teacher. Now, now he's a the man. People has become. <laughs> now he's a man. A man. A burl. This is how man. He's a sit. big old sack. Yeah. Test. Now he's got 22 inch uh, pythons. Yeah, he's got 22 no, inch pythons. They're pretty small right he's now. He's just chugging blue chews. <laughs> <laughs> Smashing them chews. Yeah. Taint as hard as a rock. Taint as hard as a rock. <laughs> <laughs> Through the mid 1930s, Toyo Kogio's business grew rapidly. Oh, Their Mazda Go truck was a hit, and they had continued success manufacturing machines. But the company's progress <laughs> would soon come to a grinding halt as the Japanese government began taking autonomy away from factories nationwide to produce weapons for their imperial conquest. Can you imagine someone putting a big old lift kit on one of these <laughs> little truck bikes, put into some huge like 37 Super Swamper mud tires on there? Yeah. Big chrome sick. wheels. Mm-hmm. Hell yeah. That's my SEMA build. Rock lights. Yep. Rock lights. A tent. Although the most commonly accepted start date for World War II is September 1st, 1939, Imperial Japan's conquest of much of Asia actually began in the early 1930s. Life for Japanese businesses during the decade continued mostly undisturbed until Japan invaded China in 1937, and the government stepped into direct manufacturing to shift to fit the needs of its military. In December 1937, some Toyo Kochio factories retooled to produce Type 38 bolt-action rifles and Type 92 heavy machine guns for the Imperial Japanese Army. After the passage of the Military and Mobilization Act in January of 1938, control of plant operations were effectively handed over to the Army and the Navy. During the final two years of the decade, Toyo Kochio and other Japanese businesses were effectively partitioned. The military controlled aspects of production based on their needs on one side and the original company and its management carried on with business as usual on the other. Jujiro continued to push the development of their growing vehicle segment as much as possible. Although the company was losing their workforce to support growing demands for wartime manufacturing, they somehow managed to develop and release new products. In 1938, Mazda released a new version of their three-wheeled truck, the Type GA Green Panel so-called for its green-paneled gauge cluster. It featured a larger cargo area than its predecessor and a lightweight aluminum alloy engine. Hmm. I feel like we kind of glossed over this a little bit, um, but 1937 is the same year as the rape of Nanking. Mm. So they directly (laughs) helped. 
with that seems like maybe maybe I mean, we just want to move possible. on. No, I mean, I think that is something that, especially uh, Japan's actions in China, definitely uh, do not get enough attention. Yeah. It's, you know, been a long time, but the Japanese government still doesn't acknowledge uh, a fair amount of war crimes perpetrated by the uh, imperial military and stuff like that. So, you know, until they do, I think it's fair to keep mentioning It's fine that to stuff. call it out. Yeah. Jujira also wanted to enter the passenger car sector, which was becoming more affordable and the company completed a prototype built under his direction in May 1940. Unfortunately, due to the ever more increasing needs of the military, production was halted and Toyo Kachio would soon be nearly overtaken by wartime production. By early 1941, even its three-wheeled trucks were being produced for the Army. It looks like a very military vehicle, mm -hmm. something that would definitely make sense, especially in the Pacific Theater of War, where yeah. lighter vehicles are probably better for the jungle. I'm watching the Pacific right now. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> I am. I that's I, that's a show. Yeah. yeah. It's the Band of Brothers. Oh. I watched Band of Brothers because Masters of the Air just came out. So I watched James is that. in his uh falling asleep watching T V era. Not because it's boring, but because Well, no, I don't fall asleep watching that. No, it's kinda hard to. Yeah, sometimes, but, but sometimes I'll find something that I don't want to watch to fall asleep. Mm. Like last night, I put on uh, Edge of Tomorrow. I love uh, Edge of Tomorrow. Ooh, me yeah. too. That's something I would put on to be like, I'm going to sleep to this. Yeah, and then get sucked in and <laughs> stay up yeah. until two. Riley did that. Yeah, Riley stayed up way too late watching. It's Edge one of, of my tomorrow. favorite movies. Yeah, it's, it's so a great good. movie. I love putting on YouTube and falling asleep, and then waking up to something completely unrelated oh, yeah, to what you're yeah. watching. I remember one time I was watching like uh, like Nile Red, the chemistry guy, mm -hmm. and then I woke up and it was like. <laughs> A Chiefs game from 1997. <laughs> I was like, how did this happen? The only connecting thing is that they're like both red. It's like three in the morning and John Madden is yelling. Yeah. Uh, or like back the when there were DVDs, you'd like fall asleep watching oh, yeah. a movie and wake up Ooh. to like some weird the like, menu music. Menu. Yeah. Creepy yeah. ass yeah. menu music if yeah. it's like The Ring or something. Uh -huh. I don't Dude, know my, my that, first roommate when I moved out would fall asleep to 2001 A Space Odyssey. Uh -huh. And then the, the menu screen was just like an alarm. Oh, and he slept so deep that I every every night at like four in the morning I had to like yell to him. What a terrible off. menu screen! Yeah, yeah, it was a uh, not the Criterion Collection. I'll tell you that. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> I'll tell you that. World War II became truly global after the Japanese Navy bombed U.S. military targets in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, on December seventh, nineteen forty-one. Japan was in a state of total war and Jujiro was now in charge of making sure the military's orders for his factories were carried out. For almost four years, the Mazda brand trucks, as well as Toyo Kuchio's other products like rock drills and machine tools, went primarily to the military. The company also produced guns throughout the war, and as more and more Japanese factories were bombed, they were asked to produce munitions and aircraft engine parts as well. As the American military island hopped across the Pacific, it continued to bring air bases closer to Japan. Once the planes were within range of Japan, a massive firebombing campaign was established to destroy Japan's industrial capacities and to strike fear into its citizens. Hiroshima, somehow though, managed to escape the brunt of this vicious bombing campaign. And as the war was drawing to an obvious end, it seemed as though they'd be spared from the total devastation that had already come from most Japanese cities. Well, Hiroshima like wasn't a big city and didn't really produce a lot of stuff that was beneficial to the war effort. Like there was really no reason to bomb Hiroshima mm -hmm. and they weren't even in like the top five choices. Right. I remember that scene from Oppenheimer. Mm. I haven't seen it. Oh, there's just good. a list of cities and they're like, mm. which one? Oh yeah. And this guy, there was Kyoto was on the list and then yeah. the guy was like, Oh, uh, I vacation, vacation in Kyoto. There. It's nice. We, yeah. Let's go something else. Yeah. But in the summer of 1945, Hiroshima's good fortune would become its curse as the relatively untouched city became an ideal target to display the destructive force of a new weapon. At 8.15 on August 6th, 1945, Jujiro was on his way back from the Fuchu factory from the company headquarters in Hiroshima when a bright flash illuminated the city. Only three miles away, he and his car were thrown from the road by the shockwave. He and the driver, both injured, climbed from the car to find an enormous fireball had consumed the city. In the following days, the blaze subsided, and the extent of what happened became known. Hiroshima had been the target of the world's first atomic bomb, 
and lost over a third of its population in the explosion. The city was effectively leveled, and the Toyo Kachio headquarters that Jujira had just visited that morning was in ruins. Have you ever heard of the guy that was bombed in Hiroshima? There were 16 then, people who were bombed in Hiroshima, went to Nagasaki, and got bombed. Jeez, I didn't know there were that many. Mm-hmm. Jujira and the Fuchu factory were relatively unscathed, thanks to the large hill that had shielded them from the worst of the blast. Jujira emerged from the wreckage, determined to do all he could to help the survivors. War production mandates were immediately lifted after the bombing, and Jujira and the company set to work. Though they could not yet produce consumer vehicles, Jujira decided to focus on bringing light to his city by helping rebuild Hiroshima. He and Toyo Kachio operated in the spirit of Amontanashi, putting others above oneself. The company helped their community as much as possible. The Fuchu plant was offered to the Hiroshima Bureau of the Japanese Broadcast Corporation to establish a reliable information source as quickly as possible. Employees were reassigned to jobs distributing medical supplies and helping families reunite with one another. For nearly a year afterward, the surviving workshops around the area were also used as emergency hospitals, police stations, a courthouse, newspaper office, and even as city hall. The war officially came to an end on September 2, 1945. Toyo Kochio was allowed to resume civilian product production in November, and did so a month later, as the need for its factory's other uses began to decline. Jujiro identified what the city and Japan needed more than anything else were Mazda trucks to help with the rebuilding efforts. The Mazda green panel, the evolution of the pride of Hiroshima, roared down the streets of the city tirelessly in the months and years following the bombing. It carried the rubble from the city, building materials to it, and citizens across it. In hindsight, it was clear there was a shift in this moment. The company had been equally at home building machines, air compressors, and trucks, but now it had shifted its attention to the vehicle, and it would never look back. Big thanks to The Freeze Pipe for sponsoring this episode of Pass Gas. Smoking cannabis doesn't have to hurt. Upgrade to a freeze pipe today and experience smoother clouds without the throat burn, chest pain, or coughing attacks. Freeze Pipe makes a unique line of freezable pipes, bubblers, bongs, and more that cool smoke by over 300 degrees. Every piece is made of thick glass and creates clouds so cold, you'll check if the bowl is even lit. The secret is freezable glycerin chambers that come on every piece. Pop one of these chambers in the freezer for one hour, and as smoke passes through, it's instantly chilled for a relaxing experience without the afterburner coffee. So we tested a bunch of these pipes out, and they're great. Uh, You throw them in the freezer for an hour, they come out, and the smoke is really cold, doesn't hurt your throat. American-owned and with over 100,000 happy customers, Freeze Pipe is your solution to smoke like royalty without paying a king's ransom. Shop now at thefreezepipe.com and use code GAS for 10% off your entire order. That's thefreezepipe.com and use code GAS for 10% off your order. Order today to get free shipping and say goodbye to harsh smoke forever. During the Allied occupation of Japan, neither Jujira or Toyo Kojio were accused or tried as war conspirators and were not subject to war reparations payments by the United States. This allowed the company to move forward rather quickly. I think we went light after World War II on countries because after World War I, we went so hard that it led to World War II. Yeah. I think there, there's a lot of like, okay, you learned. I mean, lesson. Germany still got like a trillion dollar reparation. I That's a, not the right number, but they just barely paid off mm-hmm. their reparations. Well, let's be honest, they f***ed up. They f***ed up a little they bit. Yeah. <laughs> Toyo Kojio continued to aid the rebuilding effort in Hiroshima. And as the 40s ended and the 50s began, the company and the country had begun to recover in earnest. By 1948, Mazda had established a sales presence in every Japanese prefecture and had launched an updated version of the green panel in 1949. In 1950, Mazda released a three-wheeled passenger car, the Type PB, based around the frame of the green panel. (laughs) The same year, it also launched its first four-wheeled vehicle, the Type CA, a one-ton truck. They still have the same kind of naming yeah with like Mazda and a or the Miata and Miata yeah Jujira stepped down from his post as president of Toyo Kojio in December 1951 he had an incredible career 
and an inspiring story to reflect upon. He was the son of a poor fisherman, unable to go to school, and was forced to learn trade work as a child to help support his family. He transformed two decades of learning and work experience into a business and grew it from a cow shed to a 4,000 employee facility. Jujiro went on to save Toyo Kojio from certain death, transform the company, and set its new Mazda brand on a path to be one of the most recognizable car brands in the world. His city was almost completely destroyed, and when it needed him most, he answered the call. From the outset, he wanted his company's products to improve people's lives and approach product development in an almost civic-minded way. His trucks were the pride of Hiroshima, and so was he. In one of his last acts as president, he directed the company to finance the creation of the Hiroshima Toyo Carp in 1950. Yes. A Japanese baseball team with a passionate fan base. I have a hat. His desire to give the city and the Mazda Go spirit of Hiroshima carries on today every time the team takes the field at Mazda Zoom Zoom Stadium. <laughs> Hell yeah, dude. <laughs> Jujiro died three months after stepping down on March 27, 1952, at age 76. In yeah, he didn't even get a re retirement. Yeah. In 1965, a statue was erected of him at Hijama Park in Hiroshima. According to Inside Mazda UK, Jujiro once said of his life, I treaded nothing but thorny and rocky paths. The paths were full of difficulties and agony. I walked straight, hurting, Breathing hard, sometimes blinded, I walk straight. That's a cool quote. That's like uh, a hell of a freaking quote. Yeah, that's not dude. even his first language. Yeah, he's like Johnny Cash. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Matsuda family still owns the carp. Nice. That's cool. Mm -hmm. That makes me want to be a carp fan even more. Let's do it. <laughs> you Tokyo flying hams. <laughs> <laughs> Jujiro's son. Tsuneji Matsuda became president of Toyo Kojio when he stepped down in December 1951. Tsuneji would lead the company into its passenger car-oriented future by carrying on his father's desire to have the company on the cutting edge of technology. He would also put a significant amount of faith and money into a radical new engine design and assign a brilliant engineer named Kenichi Yamamoto to lead the project. In doing so, the duo would define Mazda for generations, and the company and the rotary engine would become inseparable in the minds of enthusiasts. But you're going to have to wait until next week to hear about that. Because that's what we're doing next week. As I said before, this is a four-part series, and we're talking about the rotary next week. Hell yeah. We're beep, diving beep, beep. deeper than the mind lady in her own beep, house. Beep, beep, beep. Before we get to the mail... Just something that like the the son takes over the company, uh -huh. assuming that like hey you know dad's retiring, mm -hmm. I'm gonna take the helm and maybe he can offer advice from time to time, right? And then his dad passes away yeah. a few months later. Listener mail, Joe, take it away. Hey guys, I was listening to an old episode about John DeLorean, and you guys were asking about how big car factories are. <laughs> Sounds like a question we don't. Hey, how big are they? Hey. How big is a car factory? <laughs> how, how big they are? <laughs> I work at the Mazda Toyota plant hey. in Huntsville, Alabama, and nice. it's huge. <laughs> we have four different buildings for each stage of production, metal stamping, body weld, paint, and assembly and quality, as well as three cafeterias, oh, two, gyms, two gyms, a nice. huge admin building, well, the suits work. a test track area, training yes. center, warehouses for parts, and nice. talks of a child care facility. Oh, nice. Talks of a, Do it. two gyms, but talks of a child care facility. <laughs> <laughs> it takes about 15 minutes to walk to each building, and there are roads everywhere connecting everything. Dang. Love you guys, and what you do, keep it juiced. That's from Ember Grace. Dude, I want to go work there. I wish our office was at Mazda. Have a test track. Two gyms. Two gyms. Talks of a child. Talks. <laughs> Talks. Is, that could cool. drive a little go kart around. That'd, yeah. be, That'd be very useful for Joe. Yeah, because he's scheduled to be a father. Yeah. <laughs> Schedule. <laughs> I blocked my calendar out my calendar for the out. next Sometime 18 years. 
All right, guys. Thanks so much for listening to this episode and every other episode. If you like this show, tell your friends about it. Word of mouth really is just like the best way to spread podcasts still. Uh, Leave us a review, a like, whatever. Uh, We're the number one automotive podcast in the planet, and that's because of you guys. So thank you. And inside the planet, we're the the number one podcast in Hollow Earth, baby. Yeah, (laughs) baby. All right, (laughs) bye. (laughs) 